Hello and welcome to this Dr. Frost Maths video on Key Stage 5 Turning Points and Stationary Points. Now firstly let's define what a turning point and what a stationary point is. So if we look at this particular curve here, can we see that the gradient is zero at this point? Yep, it has no slope at all. At this point the gradient is also zero and at this point the gradient is also zero. Now this is known here as a maximum point because you can see that the graph is at its maximum in the vicinity here. In fact, we say that it's a local maximum because it's not the maximum value of y in this graph. We can see this graph goes up forever, so there is no maximum, but locally in this area, we do have a maximum here. Now here we have a local minimum point, and for this point where this gradient is zero, that is known as a point of inflection. And the definition of a point of inflection is where the line curves from one way to curving the other way. So can we see that the curve is swerving left here, but after that point of inflection, the curve is swerving right. And that point where it changes from swerving left to swerving right, or vice versa, is known as this point of inflection. Now, this point here and this point here are known as turning points because at these two points the graph is turning around. So we have a maximum point or a minimum point, we have a turning point. And for any point where the gradient is zero, so for all three of these points, they're known as stationary points. So a stationary point is just where the gradient, i.e. dy over dx, is equal to zero. That's the definition of a stationary point. Whereas a turning point is a special kind of stationary point um, where it's either maximal or minimum, where the graph is sort of turning around, hence turning point. So all turning points are stationary points, but not all stationary points are turning points because it could have been a point of inflection, which is a stationary point, but not a turning point. Now this is all we really need for the purpose of this video, is to remember that for any stationary point, the gradient is equal to zero, as you can see, the gradient is zero. So let's use that to solve these various questions. Find the coordinates of the stationary points of y equals x squared minus 6x plus 11. So if we just differentiate, because we want to set dy of dx equal to zero, we get 2x minus 6, and then the 11 disappears when we differentiate it. Any constant will disappear when you differentiate it. And because it's a stationary point, we set that gradient equal to zero, and then we just have to solve that equation, where we can add the six to both sides, and therefore x is three. But we want the full coordinate of this stationary point, so we need the y value as well. Now we can get the y value by subbing that three back into the original equation, because look, this allows us to find y in terms of x. So y is equal to three squared, minus 6 times 3, which is 18, plus 11. And that's going to be 9 minus 18 plus 11, which is equal to 2. So that gives us a stationary point of 3, 2. What about this second one? Let's differentiate again and set to 0, because it's a stationary point. So dy of dx is equal to 6x squared, you times by the power and reduce the power by 1, minus 6x, minus 36, and then, because it's a stationary point, we set that equal to zero. Notice that all of these divide by six, so we could divide both sides of the equation by six to make the numbers simpler. And now we can solve this quadratic in whatever way you like. So I'm going to factorize it. That's x plus two, x minus three equals zero. And then either x is minus two or x is three. And like before, we need to find the full coordinates of these points. So we need to sub each of these x values back into this original equation. So I'm just going to do it on my calculator. The quick way to do it is if you just type in minus 2 equals into your calculator, you can then use the answer key. So I'm going to do 2 answer cubed minus 3 answer squared minus 36 answer plus 4 and that's going to give me 48. And then, if I just type 3 equals into my calculator, 3 equals, I can then press the up key to go back to that 2 answer key minus 3 answer squared expression. But it will now use 3 because that was my last expression I evaluated. So if I just press equals again, I now get a y value of minus 77. 
What about this next one, this LXL question? Find the stationary point of this more complicated expression. Now, do you remember, if you have square roots in an expression that you want to differentiate, write them in terms of powers of x first. We have y equals x squared minus 32 x to the half, root x is the same as x to the half, plus 20. And then I'm going to differentiate. So that gives me 2x. Now we do the minus 32 times by the power, so minus 16, and then the power reduces by 1, half minus 1 is minus half, and the 20 disappears, and then we set it equal to zero because we find the stationary value. Now whenever I have a negative power in an equation I want to solve, I tend to write it without negative powers or fractional powers, so I'm going to write this back as 16 over root x, because remember negative powers means you have over something, and if it's a power of a half it's root and now I have a fraction in my equation, so I should multiply both sides by the denominator of this fraction. So if I times both sides by root x, I get 2x root x. Well, that's the same as saying 2x to the 1 times x to the half, which is 2x to the 3 over 2. And when I times this by root x, it just gets rid of the over root x. And now I can divide both sides by 2. And then I'm running out of space here. So I can add 8 to both sides, so x to the 3 over 2 is equal to 8. And then the way to get rid of a power like this is to do both sides to the power of the reciprocal. So if I do both sides to the power of 2 thirds, then that's x to the power of 3 over 2 times 2 over 3. Remember laws of indices, you times those powers together, and that just gives you x to the 1. And then 8 to the 2 thirds is equal to 4. And now I can find my y value because I just sub in that 4 into the original equation. So y is just equal to x squared, which is 16, minus 32 times the square root of 4. 32 times 2 is 64, plus 20. And that is just equal to minus 28. So there we go. Our final coordinate is x is 4 and y is minus 28. And this last kind of problem I call an optimization problem. Basically, we're trying to maximize or minimize some physical value, such as a volume or a surface area, subject to some constraint. So in this particular case, I want to minimize the surface area of this cylinder, subject to the constraint that the volume has to be 60 millimeters cubed. So let's approach this problem. A manufacturer produces cylindrical tablets of radius x millimeters and height h millimeters. The volume of each tablet is 60 millimeters is cubed, as pictured here. Firstly, show that the surface area A of a tablet is 2 pi x squared plus 120 over x. Now, I tend to just write out equations based on what's given in the problem. So firstly, we're told that the volume of the tablet is 60, so let's write an equation for that. So the volume, 60, is equal to the volume of the cylinder. Well, we know the volume of the cylinder is pi times the radius squared times by the height. So there we go, we've got one equation. And then it talks about the surface area of this cylinder. So let's write an equation for that. So A will be equal to, well, it's a solid cylinder, so we need the two circles top and bottom. So that's pi x squared, a circle, plus another pi x squared, which is two pi x squared. And then we've also got the curved surface area of this cylinder. Now, do you remember, that if I have a cylinder like this and I want the curved surface area, if I was to make a cut here, I could fold it out into a rectangle. Now the height of that rectangle is just the height of the cylinder, but the length of this rectangle, we can see, is the circumference of this circle. So that circumference of the circle is the length of that rectangle. So this rectangle is of dimensions, the circumference of the circle, which is 2 pi x, times by the height of the cylinder, x. So now we've got an expression for the surface area in terms of x and h, but this expression for the surface area is only in terms of x. What don't we have here? Well, there's no h. So we need to somehow get rid of the h from this expression for a. And the way we do that is to use substitution, because we can make h the subject to this other equation and then just substitute it into this equation here. So if we rearrange that, h is equal to 60 divided by the pi x squared, not subtract pi x squared, but divided by pi x squared, 
and then we can just substitute that into here. So we've now got a is pi x squared plus 2 pi x and then just sub in this expression. And then let's just simplify a bit. So that's 2 pi x squared plus, and then we could put this over 1. So we get 2 pi x times 60, which is 120 pi x over 1 times pi x squared. Now we can see the pi's cancel and this x cancels with one of the x's, leaving us with 2 pi x squared plus 120 over x, which is exactly what we wanted. Now we've done the sort of hard part, we've now got the differentiation. So the manufacturer needs to minimise the surface area of each tablet. So we're finding a stationary value, we're finding a minimum point or maximum point here, specifically the minimum point here. Determine this minimum surface area. So if we write this out again, but using powers of x, so that's going to be 120 x to the minus 1. Do you remember when we have x to the minus 1, that means over x, so you'd have 120 over x. Now we want to differentiate this with respect to x in this case, because it's in terms of x. We're finding dA over dx, not dy over dx, because we have a in terms of x, not y in terms of x. So let's differentiate this. Now we times by that power of 2, so it becomes 4 pi and then we reduce the power by 1, so it just becomes x. And then we do 120 times the minus 1 by the power we times it by, and then reduce the power by 1. And because we're finding a minimum or maximum value, a stationary value, we set the dy of dx equal to 0. Now, do you remember I said that if you have a negative power, we should write that without negative powers. So that's minus 120 over x squared because then we can see we need to multiply both sides of the equation to by x squared to get rid of that over x squared. So that becomes 4 pi x cubed minus, that just becomes 120 because it's got rid of the x squared, equals 0. 0 times x squared is still 0. We could divide by 4, then we could add 30, and then we could divide by pi, and then we can just cube root both sides. And let's work out what that value is on a calculator. And it is 2.12157 in millimetres. So we've worked out x now. But we want to find the minimum surface area. Now we know how to find this surface area in terms of x. So we just need to sub that value of x back into a here. Often students forget to do this last step. They got excited because they've worked out that value of x, which gives you the minimum surface area, but they didn't actually sub it back in to find out what that surface area is. So let's just sub that in just using our calculator, and I'm going to use the answer key to preserve this value. So I'm going to do 2 pi answer squared plus 120 over answer or 120 answer to minus 1 if you prefer, and that gives you a surface area of 84.8, uh, and all these units are in millimetres, so it's going to be millimetres squared. And these optimization questions are very common. Now, usually there's either some 2D shape or some 3D solid, and they'll tell you either the volume or the surface area or the perimeter or something like that, and then you need to maximise or minimise some other physical quantity. So you'll get two equations, just like we've got here. We've got one equation and another equation. You generally have to substitute one equation into the other, so then you just have an expression in terms of one variable. So here it was in terms of x and h, but we eventually ended up with expression just in terms of x. And then there will be usually some part b where you have to use differentiation to either minimise that surface area or maximise the perimeter or something like that. And there's often a part c to these kind of questions, and I think this original exam question did have a part c, where you have to justify that the value you found was a minimum, because when we found this stationary value by differentiating and setting to zero, it could have been a minimum or a maximum. It was only because we're told it was a minimum that we knew it was going to be a minimum. And we'll see in this other video how we can use the second derivative in order to justify whether a value we found was a maximum or a minimum.